radical general semantics. What strange new phenomenon is this? Part one, strike the root. Actually, radical general semantics is nothing new, not a new version of general semantics, not an improvement of general semantics, not added to general semantics. Korzybski's general semantics is already radical. By adding the word radical to GS, we are reminding ourselves of this, making it clear and explicit, especially for those of us who may have temporarily lost sight of it. Radical in this context doesn't indicate extremism. It means going to the root, to the fundamental flaw in the deep grammar of our unsane civilization, what Andy Hilgartner has called the lethal fundamental error, unconsciousness of abstraction, that is identity thinking, identification of our perceptual cognitive mappings of what is going on with reality. Korzybski would have liked this line from Henry Thoreau. There is 100 striking at, there are 100 striking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. I would add that most if not all of those 100 are striking at one another rather than at the branches. In Korzybski's words, human civilization is unsane, characterized by general infantilism, founded on strife, fights, brute competitions, etc. And he says it is important to understand the depth of the pending transition from the Aristotelian system to a non-Aristotelian system. This transition is much deeper than the change from one Aristotelianism to another. Part two, theory and practice. These parts are of very different lengths. Part two, theory and practice. General semantics, that is, radical general semantics, is not just one more intellectual semantic pursuit. Radical general semantics emphasizes the importance of neurosemantic training in consciousness of abstraction. Korzybski saw GS as a broadly human movement, potentially a mass movement involving thinkers, scientists, etc., to be sure, but also ordinary people from all walks of life with a very special focus on neurosemantic training, especially of rising generations. I just noticed in having a look at the preface to the second preface to the fifth edition of Science and Sanity that when Korzybski references educators, he always includes parents as educators. This movement would be very much concerned not only with the formulation and reformulation of non-Aristotelian formulations, but especially with the practice, continuous practice, with the structural differential, the devices, and attention to the silent object level where we live. Theoretical understanding of consciousness of abstraction is good. Even better is knowing in your bones, neurosemantically, that label is not object. An object is not event. Non-Aristotelian theorizing is good. Even better is Korzybski's prized thalamocortical integration. Of course, continuous practice is no guarantee, far from it but at least one is working at sanity in a way that goes deeper than semantics. If one is a parent, it's not radical to keep GS for oneself, neglecting to share and practice with the children. There are a number of stories in etc. of the 50s and 60s submitted by parents describing experiences with their children, such as this one, I paraphrase from memory, my six-year-old daughter has a structural differential hanging on the wall of her room. Her little friend visited yesterday and asked, what's that hanging on the wall? My daughter replied, what? Today it would be OMG. What? Oh my God, have you never seen a structural differential before? <laughs> Part three, self-help and civilizational transformation. It's not uncommon to relate to GS as if it were simply a system of self-improvement aimed at upgrading and fine-tuning individuals, communication, critical thinking, 
problem solving skills, etc. I'm certainly not opposed to the use of chunks of GS as a way of assisting oneself and others to understand better, to cope better, to live more sanely, perhaps even to flourish within the parameters of the existing order of things. Korzybski himself spent many hundreds of hours working closely and fervently with individuals, with individual problems. You can read about that in Bruce Kodish's biography. Korzybski can and should be counted among the founders of modern cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. The trace of Korzybski's impact can easily be seen in the work of the master therapist from New York City, Albert Ellis. He took one slice of general semantics, the doctrine of logical fate, and with some help from Stoic philosophy, constructed a psychotherapy for individuals, empowering them to minimize their neurotic misery by changing what they say to themselves. But he did not train them in consciousness of abstraction. He never ascended to the dimension of humanity as a whole. Here's one of the main differences between Ellis and Korzybski. Korzybski, even in his work with individuals, would not have been capable of ignoring for even one moment that insanity is not simply an individual difficulty or deficit or character flaw. <clears throat> Korzybski says, there is no simple individual, unquote. There is no simple individual. Part four, speaking of elementalism. This one gets a little bit dense, uh, theoretically speaking, so just bear with me as I breeze through some Alfred North Whitehead, etc. <clears throat> Everybody knows, it's just common sense, that everything is constantly changing and that everything is affected by its contexts. It's not radical to allow the date and chain index devices to do nothing more than reinforce that common sense. GS, in other words, radical GS, must go farther. As Alfred North Whitehead has pointed out, common sense takes nature as composed of separate self-identical entities, each one simply located in some here and now, without having any essential reference to the lapse of time, as if the lapse of time were an accident rather than of the essence of the material, as if an entity goes through changes while remaining basically the same at some illusory core. This is what Whitehead famously dubbed the fallacy of simple location. The GS date device, deployed radically as it should be, takes the lapse of time right down to the depths of being. In Robert Pula's formulation, not things changing, but change thinking. The best known GS device is without a doubt the index, which protects the unique individual entity from disappearing into the categories, classifications, generalizations under which it is subsumed, reduced to a mere instantiation or manifestation of a category. <clears throat> the chain index, which was developed by Korzybski in the mid 1940s, is an essential supplement to the index bringing, and I quote, the environment directly into the definition of the thing. In this way, the chain index prevents us from misusing the index elementalistically, mistaking the unique indexed individual as a simple isolated entity containing its existence within itself, as if it existed prior to its contexts and could move or be moved from one context to another being more or less affected while remaining somehow the same. Whatever is singular, unique, in other words, nothing but itself, is what it is only as the confluence of all its contexts, past and present, and flip, it is the confluence of all its contexts only as itself. Radical GS will neither reduce an entity to nothing but its contexts, nor to a self-identical entity which is more or less affected by its context while remaining free from context at its illusory core. <coughs> no, no, says the chain index. The thing in a different context is no longer the same thing. Similar, perhaps, 
but not the same. A provocative example is offered by Francis P. Chisholm in his introductory lectures on GS 1945, which I, I've been trying to get hold of for a while. I just can't find it anywhere, but I did have a copy once, so I can vouch for the more or less validity of what I'm going to quote. The radio in your car on an open highway is not the same as the radio going under a bridge. The radio cuts out. And not the same as the radio going under a high transmission wire. The radio squeals. If car radios 2016 don't behave this way, think instead of cellular phones in different environments. Stubborn Aristotelians would like to think that there is a cellular phone in itself which remains identical to itself while functioning differently in different contexts. But everything is function. There is no it apart from the context which has different functions in different contexts. The thought of the car radio in itself is actually about the radio in a context where it is functioning as it should. And yes, it should. This intra-activity of index and chain index is painfully offensive to our Aristotelian intelligence, bound as it is to the two-valued law of identity, unable to think of these two, index and chain index, as both two and not two. Each device, I've only mentioned two, but each device, and there are five or six depending on how you sort them, each device somehow implies, contains the others. Go deeply into one, you find the others. Index, singular being, this. Date, historical being, this as time. Chain index, contextual being, this its contexts, etc. Endless being, this and, 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 and. Quotes and hyphens, relational being, this, its relations. That little ditty comes from the book of Radical General Semantics, page 71. Uh, part five, your very own self. As students of RGS, we do not exempt ourselves from the structural differential, which maps what is going on inside the skin just as much as it maps what is going on outside the skin the map is multi-ordinal, that is, multi-leveled. Event, object, labels. At the event level, the world, all the way from Korzybski's swirl of subatomic particles, through the pre-human and human biosocial processes up to this moment, all the way to the most immense cosmic process, the world, is manifesting as your very own self right now. Incidentally, one of Korzybski's many early versions of the anthropometer, the precursor to the structural differential, the anthropometer, the measure of man, was labeled the world. At the object level, you are the living, breathing, being, seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, tasting, moving, aging, dying. At the label levels, you are the story or stories of your life. That is, you are what you say you are, what you think you are, which depends almost entirely on what others have said, written, and broadcast as time binders. Here, label and object cooperate to construct the narratives and identities that organize, stabilize, and give conceptual meaning for better and for worse in accordance with logical fate to your existence. Insofar as you are conscious of abstracting, you know in your bones, neurosemantically, that these levels of self are not identical. Pointing to the levels of the structural differential as a map of self, shh, this is not this, is not this. You know that when you identify the stories or even your sensory experiences as yourself, you are captivated in a phantom semantic structure, false to fact, unsane. Yourself can actually exist only as multi-ordinal. To know yourself as multi-ordinal is an essential work of sanity. Part six, 
this is a, a, a long section, and it's, um, let's say, at the cutting edge of my thinking about stuff. So I'm, I'm not absolutely happy with it as, as I am with the previous sections. Absolutely happy not. So absolutely happy with this one, but it's the best I can do right now. <clears throat> Mapping personal problems in biosocial space. You've heard this many, many times. Some people want to blame biological and or social circumstances, the system, or heredity, or the brain, or the environment, or capitalism, or racism, or patriarchy, or all of the above for their personal difficulties as if they as individual decision makers bore no share of the blame for causing those difficulties. So where to assign the blame? to the individual decision maker or to the biological and social circumstances. It's very easy to burst this either or bubble with both and solutions. Even some of the most hardened devotees of two valued either or thinking can take one small step to both and formulations which want to share the blame. But look, both and can be just as elementalistic as too valued, just as elementalistic, just as too valued as either or. RGS, in my opinion, will not map biosocial circumstances side by side together with the, together with the individual decision maker in a lineal manner. RGS will not map biosocial circumstances side by side together with the individual decision maker in a lineal manner on the same level so that we could ascribe, say, 30% of the blame or causal power to the individual decision maker and, say, 70% to biological and social circumstances. The biological and social circumstances uh, almost always framed as contributions or factors, are usually taken as extenuating circumstances which reduce the amount of fault, blame, causation ascribed to the individual, thus mitigating the punishment, righteous anger, or contempt we feel entitled or obligated to direct at miscreants. This way of mapping is, in my opinion, highly unsane, whether it is deployed by so-called liberals who are inclined to stress the systemic causes or by so-called conservatives who stress the blame deserved by the decision maker. Both players in this extremely popular Aristotelian game ignore the multi-ordinality of the situation. Again, multi-ordinal, I mean many levels. A non-Aristotelian multi-ordinal formulation of the relation between biosocial conditions and individual decisions will put conditions first and decisions second. So I can map it this way. Conditions first and decisions second. This is similar to the order of the structural differential event first, object second, label third. We got order, first, second, third, and so on. In other words, the decision maker is at a lower level of reality and existence than the myriad causes and conditions. Social and biological causes and conditions first, individual decisions second. Human beings do not exist first, prior to the circumstances into which they are born, and then come together somehow to constitute society. And they don't choose their heredity. At every moment, their decisions emerge deterministically out of the totality of past and present circumstances, inside and outside the skin, into which they have been thrown and yet human beings do make decisions. 
for which they must and should be accountable to others. Such accountability is indeed one of the chief features of biosocial existence. Um, you know, negative and positive reactions to ritual observance and infraction would fit here as a footnote. How then are we to understand this in a multi-ordinal, non-Aristotelian manner, that is, without distributing blame between the individual decision maker on the one hand and her circumstances on the other hand? We would have to get radical. We could, for example, adopt one of the lesser known Alcoholics Anonymous slogans. I say it's lesser known because I've checked with a few people who are in AA and they say they've never heard it. But I heard it somewhere around AA. And the slogan is, it's not your fault that you're in trouble and it's your responsibility to get out of it. That is, to do whatever you can to get out of trouble. That is, it depends on your responsibility. And we're here to help you build that ability. That's our responsibility. General semantics training might help. Get some today. <laughs> A non-elementalistic orientation cannot regress to traditional fantasies of free will that presuppose an autonomous agent somewhere inside the body-mind which can somehow, if he really wants to, rise above all the causes and conditions at work in a particular moment of action and choose freely to act otherwise. Barry Barnes, uh, a, a British sociologist, author of Understanding Agency, a book I recommend, Understanding Agency by Barry Barnes, puts it this way. <clears throat> All actions do unfold in a could not have been otherwise manner from moment to moment but a certain course of action might nonetheless be modified at any given moment and continue otherwise if an additional cause is brought to bear on it, such as perhaps an admonition from another person or a change of physiological state, leading to a variation in the next moment which itself could not have been otherwise. Here's a vignette from a case by Ellis. I just came across it while doing a fifth revision of this piece um, from Ellis's A New Guide to Rational Living, page 119. Um, Mr. S, that's Mr. Smith, who's Korzybski's client and also, it seems, Ellis's. Mr. Smith, what else could I have done? What would you expect me to do? And Ellis's response is, I would expect you to do nothing other than you did, but I would hope once I induced you to acquire a new idea or two, that you would not do what you did. That's in the future, in the next moment. Korzybski's infinite valued determinism must be a determinism of the moment. In the next moment, as the inimitable Milton Dawes has assured us, anything I can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than me. <laughs> From the last issue of etc., page 285. He sings Pardon? He sings huh? it better. What? He sings it better. He sings it better, I'm sure. <laughs> so, with the help of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, we derive this diagrammatic reformulation. Notice the non heterosexist formulation. <coughs> so we derive the following diagrammatic reformulation. Let's say X equals fault or causation, and Y equals responsibility. Here we are no longer sharing blame on a single level. So that x plus y equals 100%. Rather, we confidently violate the Aristotelian laws of thought, asserting that 100% of the fault 
the causation belongs to circumstances outside and inside the skin, and 100% of the responsibility belongs to the decision makers, so that one plus one equals one. Remember, multi-ordinality refers to multiple levels of one moment of what is going on. Elementalistic individualism, what Korzybski called the phantom semantic structure of the fictitious isolated individual, is precisely the inability to grasp this simultaneity of biosocial causation and individual responsibility. Simultaneity of biosocial causation and individual responsibility. If we return for a moment to the contrasting pair of individual and system, who's to blame? We may say that the individual is the level of the system where the system's problems are experienced, that is, at the object level where we live, and so the level of responsibility. Responsibility. Here, individuals can learn to improve their decision making abilities, to become more responsible to the degree that circumstances permit, and only to that degree. In this way, they can affect to some degree in a beneficial spiral manner, the higher level of causes and conditions. This is, this is a nodal point of the argument because I can't leave it that way. Whoops. <clears throat> Here individuals can learn to improve their decision-making abilities, to become more responsibility to the degree that circumstances permit, and in this way they can affect to some degree in a beneficial spiral manner, the higher level of causes and conditions. And so here's where the spiral starts. And you know, if you think this has nothing to do with Kozinski's spiral theory, you would be wrong. If you look at the spiral theory of manhood and humanity. Of course, put to a somewhat different use. These levels, remember, are separate. Level one and level two. They're separate and not separate the togetherness of separateness and togetherness. And now a quote from Korzybski, quote, in our old elementalistic and infantile attitudes, in 1933, they were old already, in our old elementalistic and infantile attitudes, we analyzed a child or an adult in isolation. If we abandon the problem of two-value determinism in connection with such a fictitious isolated individual, and apply infinite value determinism to an actual non-isolated individual, we realize our own responsibilities to the individual. We more and more investigate structure, language, systems, conditions of living, etc. Instead of holy frenzy for justice, punishment, etc., we would try to improve our conditions of life, educating for greater flexibility of conditional reactions end quote, Science and Sanity, 5th edition, page 551. That's Radical General Semantics, 1933. Uh, part 7, Politics. Um, pause, part 7, Politics. This is the last part. And um, again, I'm not absolutely certain I would agree with everywhere this a month from now. Politics. In my opinion, it's not radical to appropriate the formulations of GS for the purpose of winning debates with political and ideological adversaries, making ourselves even more righteous, if possible, than we already are, making these miscreants even more demonstrably misguided or malevolent. Obviously, students of GS are and ought to be free to criticize any discourse whatsoever from a GS perspective. But in my opinion, it's not radical to use GS as just one more weapon in our struggle for justice against injustice, et cetera, et cetera, without requiring from ourselves the constant effort of revision of our own habitual modes of evaluating. GS can certainly adopt the progressive slogan, another world is possible, but not if this other world is yet another unsane world in which MAP is identified with territory. Radical GS would insist that the map is not the territory is the slogan that has to come before all other slogans and above all the others and deeper than all the others. Hey ho, hey ho, identity thinking has got to go. 
What do we want? Consciousness of abstracting. When do we want it? Now. 